Africa Oil Operations Update Conference Call. I will now like to turn the meeting over to Mr. Keith Hill, President and CEO. Please go ahead, Mr. Hill. Hi, good morning uh, or afternoon or even evening for uh, everyone on the line. Uh, uh, thanks for calling into the uh, Africa Oil Conference Call. Uh, I think we are probably going to be making this a, a fairly standard thing when we uh, start issuing press releases, uh, uh, particularly operational ones from here on. Uh, as many of you are aware, the, uh, the governments, the host governments, uh, uh, particularly in Kenya, have sort of asked us to uh, do a uh, almost quarterly type update of uh, operations. Uh, and uh, what we find is that there's quite a bit of information in these releases, and uh, we thought it would be useful to, to have everyone on the line and able to uh, ask questions. So uh, besides myself on the line, I also have Nick Walker, our chief operating officer, I also have Ian Gibbs, our Chief Financial Officer. I have Paul Martinez, our uh, Vice President of Exploration. And I have Jim Phillips, uh, who's uh, Vice President of uh, Business Development. Um, I'll give a brief introduction, and then really uh, the majority of the time I'd like to uh, devote to uh, answering the questions from the people on the line. So uh, just kind of following the, uh, the press release, I think uh, probably the... Uh, the first thing in there that uh, we're excited about is the uh, discovery at Iwai. Uh, as, as many of you are aware, the northern part of the Lokachar Basin is probably the, the least explored and, and has some of the biggest uh, remaining uh, prospective resources. And I think we're, we're quite happy to see that uh, the uh, petroleum system extends there to the north. Uh, we got some nice pay sands uh, uh, in the uh, uh, where we're and even some into the Lacone. Um, uh, and, and most importantly, we have a lot of reservoir up there. I think that's one of the concerns uh, was that uh, would we have the good quality reservoir up there? And there's about 400 meters of total reservoir sand up there. The net pay thickness itself was a, a bit thinner than what we were prognosing. Um, we think it's probably because uh, Iwoi is a, a, is a relatively uh, complicated trap. So uh, as, as many of you are aware, and uh, as shown in our corporate presentation, you know, it does have some crystal faulting, and I think uh, we need to understand uh, that field a bit better. It, it's probably a little more complex than the, the ones to the south. Um, and uh, we have elected to extend the 3D seismic over that uh, trend to uh, uh, try to understand that complexity and map those faults out a little better. But I think, uh, I think we're, uh, we're very encouraged, and I think it's evidenced by us extending the 3D survey over the whole northern portion of that basin. So I think, I think that was good news. Uh, I think the second uh, main point of the, uh, um, of the press release is, is the appraisal program on uh, uh, Amosing and Gamia. I think those have been probably, the, in my opinion, the biggest highlight we've seen this, uh, uh, this past quarter. And, uh, you know, there's an old adage that says big fields always get bigger, and I think these are, are showing that same trend. I think what we're seeing in both Gamia and Amosing, those are our thickest, best pay sands. And now that we have three penetrations on each of those, I think we're feeling very confident that these sands are, are continuous over large parts of the structure, and uh, we are pushing down the oil water contacts in both of those fields. In fact, we're pushing them down so far that we're uh, having a hard time closing them uh, uh, on a simple structure. And uh, um, we are looking forward to uh, drilling our, our next well to the south in that, in that trend, uh, the uh, Ecosawan well, which... Uh, Looks like it, it may also be uh, very closely related to the Amosing and Gamia features. So we're hoping to see the same type of uh, reservoir quality and thickness uh, uh, in, as we've seen so far in the southern part of the basin. So uh, uh, many of you probably are wondering about our resource report. Uh, we were hoping to have that done in, uh, in August, but uh, uh, we've delayed that because of these results. Uh, we want to make sure that we incorporate these, uh, the results of the Gamia and uh, Amosing appraisal wells. Uh, because I think they're going to be very important in, uh, in getting those final numbers. So we, we do expect that uh, updated resource report to come out uh, sometime in the next uh, two to three weeks, and uh, uh, we're just finalizing that now. Um, moving on on the press release, uh, you know, we did test EWOI. Um, the flow rates uh, are, are a little below what we expected, uh, but uh, I would say not surprisingly below what we expected. Uh, as you're all aware, on the east side of that basin, the, the reservoirs tend to be a little thinner, uh, slightly uh, poorer quality. So I think that 50 barrels a day um, is, is not necessarily indicative of the uh, total potential of that zone. 
but I think it is showing us that these uh, the, the zones on the uh, sands on that side of the basin generally will have a lower flow rate. As we've talked about many times in the past, these, these are very big features, and I think we, uh, um, you know, still are quite interested in that side of the basin. And in fact, we're uh, you know, um, you know, considering putting 3D on that side of the basin as well um, to uh, um, try to delineate some of these because even though the flow rates are relatively low on, uh, on vertical wells, there may be uh, ways to uh, stimulate those through either acidization, fracturing, or, or even drilling horizontal wells. Uh, and with the amount of oil in place, I think we're still very keen on that side of the basin. Um, the, uh, and then the, I guess the other thing is really more talking about the, uh, um, the uh, upcoming exploration wells. So we, we are drilling a coast along, as uh, we said, but uh, I think one, one of the things that we're excited about, and I think the market is excited about, are the new basin openers. So we will be spudding the Kodos well, um, likely in September. It's uh, moving over to the basin right next to the Lokachar Basin, the Cario uh, uh, sub-basin that will be in the central Cario Basin. And uh, uh, it does look very similar to the Lokachar Basin. Uh, and again, its proximity uh, gives us uh, high hopes that uh, we may be able to open another basin uh, of the same size and, and potential as the Lokachar Basin. And then, of course, moving on, we'll move to the northern Cario Basin with that rig, and we will be moving a rig up uh, to the North Turkana area. Um, you know, over the past few months, we haven't had huge success with basin openers. I think the, the Chubahar Basin, uh, the two wells in the Chubahar Basin were disappointing to us. Um, not, even, not so much that they didn't find big uh, oil accumulations, but that uh, we uh, didn't see as much evidence of the petroleum system as we would have liked. There are some indications that there are some source rocks in those two wells um, that, that were drilled there, the uh, Shamila uh, and the Gardim wells, <clears throat> and there are some reservoirs, but we didn't see the uh, type of oil shows that uh, we would have liked to see. In fact, we didn't see the type of oil shows, shows we saw on the other side of the basin over in the uh, Sabisa and Tatule wells. I would say in the, in the other side of the basin in the Omo block, the Sabisa and Tatule wells, uh, we are quite encouraged because we did see oil shows, we did see reservoirs, we did see seals, and I think uh, you know we want to follow that up and see if we can. Um, uh, there is one prospect called the Epilot Prospect, which looks quite good just north of there, and uh, we're going to be studying that to see if that might be a, a likely new drill candidate. Uh, we have recommended uh, to partners and are pursuing with the government to uh, um, to go into the next phase on on the South Elmo block, and. Uh, um, you know, we, we do think there's enough indications uh, on both sides of the basin that it, it warrants further study to see if we can drill another well. And then, of course, in our rift basin block to the north, um, we have, uh, um, uh, we're just getting ready to start shooting seismic, and there we have seen good evidence of seeps and source rocks. So I think we're, we're encouraged that that, 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 that basin trend uh, may be perspective uh, going to the north in Ethiopia. Uh, as far as the other block, block seven and eight in Ethiopia, we uh, we have notified the governments and partners that we're no longer interested in continuing in that. Uh, we did drill a well there. We uh, sort of confirmed what had been seen uh, by some previous wells, um, where we had fairly thick uh, zones that had oil shows and gas shows, but the reservoirs were were fairly tight, and uh, our concerns there are commerciality. I think there's no doubt there's hydrocarbons there. Uh, but, you know, being very remote and uh, being away from infrastructure, I think uh, uh, we were concerned that uh, we wouldn't reach commercial thresholds on that. And, and we're really looking to, uh, you know, focus our, our efforts and our funding uh, on uh, the more prospective parts of our portfolio. Um, quick word on Sala. Uh, we are drilling an appraisal well now, so uh, um, we, we will likely have that, those results in September. Um, we did test uh, gas from the first SALA appraisal well. Um, obviously, the, uh, the challenge is uh, monetization of gas. We've had several meetings with the Kenyan government and with uh, potential um, power generation partners, and we feel pretty confident that if we can find a significant amount of gas, that we can commercialize that gas. So I think the, uh, um, uh, the uh, appraisal wells will be important to see if we can actually confirm gas volumes, but I think if we're able to do that, I think uh, it's going to be a very uh, um, uh, interesting uh, market because the Kenyan government is very keen to put power solutions uh, uh, 
uh, at as quickly as possible. Uh, and I guess last thing, just to preempt the uh, funding, what are we going to do in the future question, um, you know, we, you, you may have seen we have $350 million in the bank at the end of last quarter. Um, you know, that sees us uh, through uh, mid-2015. Uh, um, you know, I think uh, it's no secret that at some point we are going to have to do something to either raise more money or find a partner or look at other solutions. Uh, but I think at, at this point there's, there's, there's uh, no rush uh, as far as we see. You know, we've got a very active uh, drilling program. Uh, we continue to build resources. I think uh, at some point we will make a decision, but I, I don't think there's anything in the uh, in the near future that uh, we see as imminent. Um, and frankly, uh, you know, access to funding, we have quite a few uh, people uh, who are, are quite keen to come in and participate in the story, as evidenced by the last funding that we did. And uh, I think that's uh, not really a, a major concern of ours. So I guess you know, summary. I think we're we're, we're still moving along quite well. We're um, I think the Bocachar Basin is looking better and better. I think the, uh, you know, when we when we first started into this basin uh, and made our discoveries at Gamie and Twiga and uh, Ituco, we were telling people we thought one to three billion barrels was the upside potential of this basin. Uh, we haven't seen anything that uh, uh, deters us from that uh, belief, uh, but we need to get out and drill some more uh, exploration wells and appraisal wells. And I think the big thing is going to be opening up a new basin. So in the next 18 months, uh, we've got 10 basins that we're actually looking at. We'll be drilling at least six of those basins, and we have another three to four basins that uh, could possibly be drilled in that window as well. So I think, uh, once again, I think we think uh, the uh, genetically similar basins, that it would be very unlikely that only one of these basins would contain hydrocarbons, and I think we're quite optimistic that we'll find another one or two basins over the next course of the next 18 months. And the importance of that, of course, is that each one of those basins could be the same size and potential as the Lokachar, you know, effectively uh, doubling the uh, potential resources in the company. Um, so with that, maybe I'll uh, go ahead and, uh, 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 Mark, maybe you can uh, go ahead and uh, open the floor to uh, questions. Thank you. We will now take questions from the telephone lines. If you have a question and are using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before making your selection. Please press star 1 at this time for any questions. You can cancel your question at any time by pressing the pound sign. Our first question is from Brendan Warren from BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, look, good afternoon or good morning, gentlemen. It's Brendan Warren from BMO. Um, just two, two questions, and Keith, you probably like covered off on the, the, the funding one quite well, but I wouldn't mind if you just talked through be it the logic now that you wouldn't be looking for either a partner or a farm down that it's probably coming back to the market and just your comfort around timing uh, with that regard. And then probably the second question uh, is probably more for, for Paul. And if I just refer to slides 15 and 16 are quite good. Just obviously the next couple of basin opening wells are important. And if you can just talk through what comparisons with the Kerio and the South Lockachow, what, what you know is similar uh, or different in terms of contrast, please. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take the first one, then I'll uh, let Paul take the second one. The uh, um, the, the, the timing of uh, going out and getting, you know, I think it's no secret that at some point we will get an industry partner. You know, uh, um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not a very big company, and this is a very big development. I think the timing of that is really how far down the path can we go to create value. And I think, you know, there are several things that are going forward. Um, you know, obviously our appraisal program and our extended well tests, I think, are going to be very key to proving up resources. You know, and at the end of the day, um, I think that's what most companies would base their valuation on is more the, uh, um, shall we say, contingent resource uh, 2C type numbers. So I think uh, the, the further we can go down that path, I think uh, the more value we can create. Now, in parallel with that, of course, people want to see what's happening with the development. And I think the development, uh, uh, particularly the pipeline, is also moving at a very good pace. But I think the more certainty we can get around development, again, I think the more willing people are going to be uh, able to, willing to, to pay money for uh, those resources as they get a very clear path to, the, uh, um, to, to development and, and production. But I think, you know, there's there's... Uh, there are many schools of thought of when the optimum time is, but I think the more clarity we can get on resources and the more clarity we can get on um, on the development plan, I think the higher valuation we'll get, kind of, shall we say, on a per barrel in the dollar per barrel in the ground, 
um, we will get. And then, of course, as we've drilled basin opening wells, um, you know, the, that, that may also come into play, that uh, if we open up a new basin, then, um, you know, the, the, all bets are off. And, uh, you know, the, the valuation goes up significantly. Can I, can I clarify something? Can, will the government allow you to farm down a particular area of two blocks, for example? Can you unitize a portion of two blocks for farm down? Yeah, I don't think you necessarily unitize, but you, you, you can select whichever blocks. Uh, um, you know, and obviously with 10 dB and 13 T being further along with the, in terms of resources, a development plan that probably is going to be more interest uh, to more companies. So um, that, I don't think there's any restrictions on uh, um, which blocks uh, you can do. Uh, um, you, and, and I think I think that's where companies will likely be most interested. Uh, but people will do like expiration upside too, you know. And, and there's a there's a there's a philosophy you don't want to you don't want to give away too much of the upside. You want to leave a little bit for the uh, partners to come in as well. Thanks, Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Uh, well, you referred to this slide 15, which is a full tensor gravity map of the of the South Cario or South Lokachar and Central Cario Basin and other basins between 10 dB and 10 dBA as well, 13 T. Uh, you know, we find this map extremely helpful in that it it, it shows fairly clearly. Uh, now you don't have to be a, a, a uh, an interpreter of a gravity map to see how similar these uh, these basins are. Uh, what we're struck by is the similarity between the South Lokashar Basin um, and, and the uh, Cario Basin to the east, and, and for some of the other basins like North Lokashar, for that matter. Uh, you asked about the comparison between the two, and, and certainly what you're you know what you're wondering is our confidence about Kodos. And as we've said before in these basins, it really is all about the source rock. Um, but I'm going to work through some, some comparisons on, on the structural side uh, first. Um, when we um, were, were acquiring seismic in the South Cario Basin, South Lucashar Basin, sorry, we tried to uh, shoot seismic lines from, from one basin to another. And in the South Cario Basin, you can, you can see in the far southwest corner of the map, there's there's a couple of seismic lines that, that go from one basin to another. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, what we have going from one basin to another is just a seismic line. Uh, we think that we can follow the source rocks up pretty far, but the basement out, outcrops in the, in the southern margin. So it really does take a well before, the, before we know that the same source rocks that worked in the South Lokashar Basin are in the Cario Basin. But that's one thing. Uh, even even if these basins have a slightly different stratigraphy, the nice thing about the rift basins is the way they genetically form. They, it, you would expect that in the in, in, in the period of their formation, the lakes form, and then you could have a different age source rock in any one of these basins. So, sure, we'd like to see the same exact source rock going from one basin to another, and we look for that. But we can all also uh, look to uh, the possibility that we have new and, and different source rocks. Uh, but ultimately here in the uh, in the Cario Basin, we need to drill a well to, to look at the stratigraphy and confirm source rocks. If you go to slide 16, I think what, what excites us about this basin is it's a, it's practically the spitting image of, of, the, of the South Lokashar Basin in terms of the structural style. You see the rift bounding fault on the uh, on the west side of the map um, here. This this inset map on the right side of slide 16. Uh, uh, just just no shortage of structures in this basin. So very similar to the South Lokashar. If we're successful uh, in Kodos, it opens up uh, a, a very large prospect inventory that we can follow on quickly. So very, very generous helping of, of prospects in this space and should it work. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Shaheen Amini from TD Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Um, two questions, please. Uh, first on the ETOM uh, discovery. Uh, from memory, I think the pre-drill estimate was around 450 million barrels. Uh, from what you said, uh, sounds like the thickness of uh, what well, the net pay was less than prognosis. So, do you have any 
so ballpark figures in terms of uh, the, the the variance uh, of what you expect to have there now compared to the pre pre drill estimates. And the second question, um, I found the slide four in uh, slide four in your new presentation quite interesting uh, compared to the previous corporate presentation where you're actually showing the stratigraphic prospects in Lockheed Charles Basin. I uh, just wonder whether you could uh, provide a bit more technical detail on those prospects, uh, what's you, uh, how they fit in and your priorities at present. And also maybe comments on the, the well, indicative size of the Ecoswan uh, prospect and the fact that it seems to be kind of joined to Amosing, separated by fault. Um, so, uh, and I assume that's really on the back of the 3D seismic interpretation. Yeah, I guess to take them in turn, uh, ETOM, it's not quite as simple as that. But, you know, there, the, we, we, we talked about the ETOM complex having 450 million barrels. It's actually made up of three sub-prospects within that. But we drilled the central prospect, uh, um, which, which had about uh, 87 million barrels of, of prospective resource at the, uh, uh, at the aware, aware, aware level. So, again, uh, I hate to speculate, um, ETOM is not, we, the cutoff was done uh, for the resources before the ETOM well was uh, announced and finalized, so that one won't be in the resource update. Um, um, so I, it's a little hard to speculate exactly how that will come up. I think uh, I'll feel more, much more confident than that once we've seen the 3D. You know, the, the central fault block, we expected that column to be a bit thicker, which suggests maybe a couple of those faults aren't as sealing as we we uh, think they would be. But I think until we kind of map it out with the 3D, I don't think we're going to drill another well until we have seen the 3D interpretation, understand this well result, um, and then uh, and then we'll be in a much better position to, to to say what we think the ultimate volume of these uh, of these prospects are going to be. Uh, it's likely uh, we're not going to be waiting a year to do uh, uh, resource updates anymore. I think. Um, there's probably going to be more like a six-month timeline. I think you'll probably see that, you know, after the first of the year, probably with the, you know, year-end results. I think we may look to do another resource update. With, with you know, all the rigs working as fa uh, the, at this pace, I think uh, uh, waiting a year is uh, is probably too long to do that. So I think we'd, we'd see that. I think uh, your second question about the stratigraphic prospects. Um, the good eye on that. Um, uh, the, that if you go to the next page. Uh, if you look at those, uh, what we call reservoir number two, uh, which are these sandstones within the Lacone shales, um, we're seeing some interesting things in the basin, some amplitude-related uh, uh, um, features that we think um, may be more stratigraphically related. And uh, I think what's what's exciting about that prospect number two um, is, is it really may be, uh, and, and, and use the term loosely, unconventional prospect. Um, these sands are right within the thick present-day generating shales. So these sands may actually be draining the, uh, um, the, the, uh, um, uh, the currently generating uh, thick lacone um, source rocks, which for those of you familiar with the Bakken uh, know that that's what happens there, is that basically it's the sands that are in the Bakken shale source rocks that are uh, providing most of the, uh, um, the production. So I think that's a very... We've already seen those sands to be productive on both sides of the basin, at the Twiga well and at the uh, Atuka well. So um, you can follow them into the basin, and you can see that they have some very good seismic amplitudes associated with them. So it's a, it's a little more of a, you know, I, I think we will we'll follow that play up and, and drill, but it, it, as you can see, some of the size of the blobs alone, that uh, uh, they could be quite big, and they could have a big unconventional um, um, component to them. And then I guess if you if you look at the uh, your last question there, talking about uh, um, uh, Ecosawan and how it fits together, uh, I think you're probably referring back to uh, uh, slide number um, six there, um, where you see that uh, um, now that we've drilled Amasing down dip um, and Yamia down dip, it's getting very hard to isolate uh, Ecosawan from from Amosing. In fact, there is a prospect now that's kind of between uh, Ecosawan and Amosing that we've seen uh, uh, and is confirmed on the 3D seismic. So we don't quite understand that. That's why I think Ecosawan is going to be a very interesting well. We're going to be drilling that. 
and uh, depending on what we see as far as uh, um, potential column heights, potential pressures, you know, the other thing that, that, that makes this whole thing interesting is there seems to be a lot of pressure communication between some of these reservoirs, suggesting that they may be over large areas. But I think Ecosawan is going to be a, a quite an interesting prospect. You know, is there a stratigraphic uh, uh, trap down there? Is there a, a, uh, some of these smaller faults? Do they potentially feel? Uh, you know, we won't know that till we drill the well. But uh, uh, cer certainly, that southern area of the basin to me is is looking quite interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Dan Eckstein from UBS. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, my first question is on the drill out of the locker jar. Um, I think if we were to rewind 12 months, the expectation was that the locker jar would have been fully drilled out by the end of 2014. Um, I guess you know, Etom's given you a, a good problem in, in that respect, um, but um, you know, it now seems that with the 3D seismic being shot, um, you know, the drill out of the locker jar is probably not going to be complete until and perhaps middle of next year. Um, you previously said that you expected the farm dam process to start beginning of 2015, um, and that it made sense to go back to back with Tullow in order to maximize potential interest. How does the lengthier drill out of the locket char influence your views on, on whether um, it still makes sense to, to go back to back with Tullow? or whether you'd, you'd think about going it alone in terms of a farm. That'd be the first. Yeah, certainly you wouldn't want to speak for Tello. I mean, they, they'll uh, they'll uh, do what the, um, what's, it, what's in their best interest, obviously. We you know we, ha we have had discussions about this, but uh, I think there's nothing uh, in place at all. Um, I don't think it really changes what uh, we would do going forward. You know, the, the process will take some time, I think, uh, you know, at least six months. But I think during during that time we will be continuing to drill. You know, the plan is now to have four rigs working full time uh, in this basin for the foreseeable future. So you know, as as things, uh, if there is a process which goes on next year or the following year, or whenever it's uh, um, deemed suitable to do, um, you know, there will be uh, um, information that will be uh, introduced into the process as we go along. And if we make a big discovery at Etom North, you know, obviously it's in our best, best interest to drill some of these wells sooner than later so that they can be put into the valuation. But I, I don't think it's a it's a main driver. I mean, a lot of those, when, when we when we said last year we'd be drilling out all the prospects uh, in 2014, I think that's pretty well true for all the prospects we had. You know, we are getting some new prospects now. A lot of the Etom North and Etom East prospects didn't exist in 2013. Uh, you know, some of that is off the new seismic. So I think... Uh, um, you know, Nikosawan, I think, is going to be interesting. You know, we, we didn't plan on drilling these appraisal wells at Amasing, but once we saw how thick and good Amasing was, we, we switched some priorities to drill some of those uh, Amasing appraisal wells. Nikosawan could have the same effect. If we see something really interesting in Nikosawan, we may want to um, redirect our, our rigs uh, to uh, uh, try to do some appraisal wells down there. But I think that we, we like to stay kind of... Uh, the ability to be uh, fluid and, and, and move our program around as we see results, and of course, uh, you know, as we as we get the 3D results in the north, uh, I would expect to see a lot more prospects up there. I think, you know, on the 2D we've seen the big stuff, and I think even in the whole um, western basin bounding fault, I mentioned that we're kind of getting one new prospect coming up between Amos, Amosing and Ecosawan. I would expect to see a lot more smaller prospects uh, uh, emerging between the, the very big bumps. I think uh, uh, I think that that's the key for us. You know, the the, the acquisition of the 3D is north of Am of Gamia Field now. And we haven't got the processing. We just got the processing uh, um, uh, coming through on Amasing. So as we get the 3D acquired and processed, um, you know, we may be shifting as well. But uh, on the overall, I think you know we, we'll just keep exploring. Uh, as I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with leaving a little bit of uh, um, up, up exploration upside on the table for. Uh, Central partner coming in. Okay. Um, just on financing again, um, could you could you talk about how taxation risk influences your potential choices there? Yeah, you're probably referring to the capital gains tax, which has been a uh, um, press on. I mean, uh, this is nothing new. I think the, the the Kenyan government has been talking about capital gains tax for uh, 
uh, a couple of years now, and uh, of course we've seen it in uh, um, Uganda to the uh, and, and uh, in, in countries like uh, Mozambique to the south. You know, it's, it's still our opinion that uh, you know capital gains tax uh, uh, is, you know may not be applicable to uh, current PSAs, and uh, we see it as potentially a, uh, a damaging uh, tax to, to get new investors and new investment and particular for sort of aggressive explorers. We've had several meetings uh, and discussions with the government on that, uh, not just ourselves, but COGA, which is the uh, Kenya Oil and Gas Association. So there's, there's, a, there's a finance, uh, there's, a, there's a petroleum legislation currently being considered by the parliament, and capital gains will be one of those. You know, uh, I think we, we have to be realists, uh, you know, that there, there may be a capital gains tax imposed, you know, depending on the uh, amount of that capital gains tax. You know, it could potentially affect whether uh, uh, how we go forward in our farm out process. I think it's very clear in the legislation we've seen so far that if it's a farm down where we basically don't repatriate funds that were being carried forward on it, on expiration costs, that uh, we would not think that that would be subject to any capital gains tax. If it's an outright sale of the company for cash, I think there would be a consideration of capital gains. I think for us the important thing is just to know that ahead of time. I think it's actually good that it seems to be coming to a head now and uh, um, not only capital gains on the uh, petroleum industry, but capital gains in general. You know, capital gains tax in Kenya has been suspended since 1985, and now they're looking at um, reinstituting it on all industries. So I think uh, you know, the, the best thing you can do is uh, get it sorted out before you do any transaction. The, the, the worst thing you do is... Um, have a, a big pile of money and basically ask the Kenyan government how much they want of it. So I think uh, it's, 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 a, it's a much better thing to have that uh, known up front, uh, which I think, uh, um, you know, in other places uh, that, that's been a problem is that the transaction's been done and then they start discussing capital gains tax. Just quickly, final question. Um, um, sort of, you presented some slides on the Kerio Basin and you know, the... the Geological similarities between that and, and, and the Lockheed Char. Could you just remind us why the Kerio was not prioritised ahead of some of the more aggressive step outs to the north into Ethiopia? Was this a strategic or, or logistical decision? Um, kind of a couple of things. I mean, uh, one, we had some you know, work program obligations to do. Um, there were there were wells, uh, particularly in Ethiopia, that had uh, you know we, we had farmed into a block there, and the clock was already ticking. So we we did have some drilling commitments that made us accelerate our, our efforts up there. And then uh, the second thing is really when we had the seismic. So uh, um, we didn't shoot a lot of the local, the uh, Cario Basin seismic until uh, uh, within the last uh, uh, 12 to 18 months. So we didn't really have a good understanding how good that basin looked until we saw the seismic. So uh, um, priority, priority-wise, uh, we always liked this basin. It was really getting out, getting the seismic, and getting... Uh, we thought was the best prospect uh, to test that location. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Once again, please press star 1 for any questions. Our next question is from Michael Alsford from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Just a quick question, actually, on recovery rates. So I guess there is a reasonable spread on, on, on a view on what recovery rates you can get from I guess both the the Aurora Sands, but also the Lacone shales. Um, can you maybe update us to, as to where you're thinking potential recovery rates could be, both on a sort of a primary and secondary recovery scenario? Um, and that would be really helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head, and I think that's one of the, the hardest parts of evaluating uh, the company from you know from an analyst perspective. And uh, um, is there is a big range of what the recovery will be on this? You know, frankly, uh, you know between ourselves and our partners and uh, even amongst the analysts, uh, I don't think there's a big uh, spread on oil in place. I think we all agree that there's these, these reservoirs are incredibly thick. They contain an awful lot of oil, and, um, and the size of the structures, we don't really have too much debate on. It's, it's really how much are we going to get out, what percentage. And I think the answer is uh, um, uh, right now the range is quite wide, I would say. It could be anywhere from, uh, you know, our our our, per, our internal opinion is it's probably uh, the lowest it could possibly be is is, is in the upper teens, uh, and it could go up into the upper 30s. Uh, I think the uh, um, from if you look at just the core data, 
Um, these are good reservoirs, uh, particularly I, I speak specifically about the uh, Wereware Reservoir. They have 20 to 30 percent porosity. They have uh, hundreds of millidarcies up to met several darcies of permeability. You know, from a pure uh, um, theoretical standpoint, we'd expect those rots to have recovery factors in, in the 30s. Um, um, however, you know, we need to do some more work to demonstrate that. But one of the big things we're going to be doing in our appraisal programs going forward are extended well tests on, on two of the main fields, the Amasing and Gamia field. And I think that's going to give really valuable information as to what those recovery factors are. Um, the, uh, we'll do inject, injectivity tests, we'll do interference tests, and we'll put them on longer term uh, production tests where we can see how these, these, these fields perform. You know, I think uh, until until we've done that, we're also doing a significant amount of special core analysis, uh, which will also be quite helpful for that. Um, you know, I think that range will persist until we've done that work, and that that, that is, uh, you know, when we talk about timing of doing an industry deal, I think that's one of the biggest questions to resolve uh, before we you know, move forward with a with a uh, an industry deal um, is, you know, what is this recovery factor? Um, what are the well rates going to be in uh, in production? You know how, how much oil are we going to get out of that? So you'll see in our appraisal program, and if you look at the uh, the, the slide that shows what we're going to be doing on appraisals, we've got a lot more wells to drill on appraisal, and, uh, and I think those extended well tests are going to be very key to try to tighten up that uh, that factor. But I can tell us, you know, our our people and uh, uh, you know believe that we will end up in the 30s, but uh, I think there's a you know we need to prove it to ourselves, to our reserve auditors, and our investors and potentially our partners uh, uh, who would come in, uh, what that number is, because uh, right now there is a lot of uncertainty with it. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Our next question is from Al Stanton from RBC. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning, folks. Here's a couple of questions, please, if I may. Um, it was suggested by the operator that the drilling in the Tuba Har Basin was on a sort of first-come, first-served basis. You drilled the first prospect you came across, not necessarily the best one. So I was wondering uh, what the priority list is for um, the, the Kirio Basin, what is, what is driving the hierarchy of which prospects you drill first. And then also, um, we we're talking a lot about going from the South Lokachar to the Kirio Basin, but we're not really talking about the North Lokachar Basin. I was just wondering why not, it, given that it is arguably a long trend. Yeah, we do have, um, well, I guess to answer your first question first, uh, if you remember, we we have changed uh, in Kirio. So we, we did have Daipa as our first prospect, and uh, when we shot more seismic, we actually found Kodos was a better-looking prospect. So again, we had a little bit more time to uh, make that decision uh, in the Cario Basin than we had in Chubahar. Chubahar, we had a rig basically standing by in Ethiopia with nothing else to do, and uh, I think uh, we uh, we made the decision that um, the Shamila well was a good well and uh, it would test the the play concept. Um, you know, in retrospect, there might have been better ones, uh, and uh, and we haven't given up on that basin yet. You know, we uh, we need to do some homework. We've got a lot of new data on that, but. Uh, I haven't given up on drilling another well in the Chubahar, but we have to understand what we've seen with those first two wells before we uh, make a commitment to do that. So I think on the on the, on the uh, North Cario, um, it just didn't have as many prospects. Uh, we shot the original seismic there, and we didn't see quite as many well-defined prospects along that western basin margin as we saw down to the south. Uh, it is a deep basin. It is on trend, and it's, it's a good question. Uh, you know, you'll see... Uh, on uh, the slide there, we do have a well planned in there um, for going forward. So we are shooting additional seismic there, and we do plan to follow that up. But uh, it's just uh, the, the first pass of seismic didn't show as much prospectivity as far as the number of prospects and the prospects kind of along that uh, basin bounding alt trend that you know look like the Gamia, um, Amasing, Twiga type traps, um, which is one thing that the Cario Basin has in spades. You know, there's five or six of those that look very much like the uh, um, the prospects in the Lokachar Basin. So if, if we hit on um, that uh, Kodos well, I think you'll see us, uh, um, you know, immediately uh, start thinking about committing another rig in there, or maybe bringing in a rig to start drilling, drilling that whole string of pearls trend in the uh, in, in the uh, Cario Basin. And then, of course, on the other side of the basin, there's that big Mamba feature. Mamba's the biggest prospect we've got in the portfolio in size, uh, in their aerial size. 
and uh, you know it looks a lot like a Tuco, which of course uh, we, we have a moment of pause because the Tuco didn't turn out quite as good as we liked in the uh, local turn basin. But there's no reason to think it couldn't be. Uh, you know, the re the reservoirs may be different in the uh, Cario basin. So from a size perspective, I, I think if we uh, drill a successful well at Kodos, you'll see us trying to accelerate that. Uh, um, it's, it's actually not called Mamba anymore. <laughs> um, what's, what's the name of that one, Nick? Lakwa. Lakwa, that's it, yeah. Can, one, and one final question then. Um, on, on the expiry of uh, eight, uh, the licenses, is, is relinquishment a, at all an issue at this stage? Um, in some, some, some of them it is, and some of them it isn't. Um, um, I think we have a relinquishment coming up in the uh, uh, South Omo block, which is a fairly large relinquishment that we're talking about with partners now. Um, several of the blocks have very large areas that uh, are probably non-perspective and they'd be less of an issue. So I think the uh, um, uh, right now we're not too concerned um, with any of the areas uh, that we're going to have to relinquish things that we think are perspective, but we are aware that the clock is ticking. Most of our most of our blocks we have two to three years on. I think 10BA is the exception. We still have about five years on that. Uh, so we, we are very cognizant that uh, we're going to have to get after these and, and uh, get them explored uh, before the uh, expiry. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Hill, we have no further questions at this time. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for calling in. Good to see we still have a lot of interest. Uh, I think uh, uh, the stock has suffered a bit over the summer. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping uh, part of our suffering is because uh, all of industry suffered with a, with a, a few other factors. but. Uh, I think uh, we're still seeing very good results in the uh, Locatar base, and I think we'll, we'll continue to grow reserves there. Uh, we still see a lot of expiration potential, not only in Undill Prospect, but uh, in some of these other reservoirs that we'll be following up. And I think the key is now to get in and uh, open up at least one other base in, uh, in, our, in our program going forward. All right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, um, I think uh, the next release probably what will be coming out will be the resource update, and I think the we may uh, have a similar type call to uh, uh, address that when it comes out. Thank you. The conference right. call has now ended. Please disconnect your lines at this time, and we thank all who participated. Welcome to the Instant Replay System.